Hey, welcome to Conversations with a Therapist podcast. I'm Jennifer Chalo, I am a counseling psychologist and I am a writer and I am also the host of this show. My work focuses on breaking down complex psychological concepts into practical and actionable frameworks that you can implement to be to build a meaningful life. If that is something that you're interested in, then I highly highly encourage you to subscribe to this podcast and share the link with at least one person in your contact list. You never know who desperately needs to hear this message today and you could be the person that connects them to a resource that changes the rest of their life. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you have any questions about psychology, then send them to the email address in the description box. With that said, let's jump right into today's episode. In the last episode, I introduced you to cults. For those who may not have gotten an opportunity to listen to that previous episode, I will repeat the working definition of what a cult is. A cult is a group or a movement held together by a shared commitment to a charismatic leader or an ideology. It has a belief system that it has all the answers to all of life's questions and it offers a solution, a special solution to be gained only by following the leader's rules. So that's just like a general working definition of what a cult is. In this episode, we are going to be answering one big question, and that question is, are you in a cult? Before we even dive into this, I want to start by saying something that I said again in the previous episode, because I think it's important that this is repeated, just to make sure that everybody understands. First of all, I am not attacking any specific group of people or any individual. I am just relaying facts that are in the public domain. So, for example, if you hear me give examples of cults that are religious, if you hear me mention a religious body of some sort, whether it's the one you belong to or one you know somebody belongs to, do not take this information as Jennifer attacking my specific church or religion or whatever denomination I follow. Take it as information and then you can make a decision whether it's information you want to believe in or information you want to disregard. I want that to be out there so that I am attacking churches and I am attacking religious people. I am attacking pastors and pastresses. That is not my intention. The second thing that I mentioned in the previous episode that I want you to keep in mind as we continue with this series and this episode is the fact that cults operate on fear. And I mentioned this in the previous episode. Um, cults will find as many ways as possible to keep you afraid, uninformed, and isolated. Because if you are informed and not afraid and connected, not isolated, then it's very difficult for them to pass their message to you and hammer it into your psyche. That It's very difficult for them to like eradicate your personhood, your, your ego. It's it, it, almost impossible for them to do that. And so they will use these tactics, these fear-inducing tactics to make you feel afraid and uninformed and to stay isolated. And you will see that as we as we go on with this conversation, we're going to see some of the techniques that they use to keep you in these three states. Keep that in mind as we go on with this entire series and episode. Okay, so answering the big question of this episode, are you in a cult? There are 10 characteristics that you can use to determine whether whatever you belong to is a cult. So these 10 are shared among many cults. You'll find many cults have these 10 characteristics. And as I said, not just because just because um, whatever your organization you belong to has maybe one or two of these does not mean automatically that your cult that, that whatever you belong to is a cult. Secondly, as something else I said is that um, not all cults not all cults are destructive. Not all cults are damaging. Some of them are do not hurt people. It's just a bunch of people living their life differently than mainstream ordinary human beings. So. Just because you are in a group or you belong to a thing, a denomination or whatever, you belong to a particular movement that lives differently from other people, it does not mean automatically that you that whatever you belong to is a cult and that it is destructive. So, yes, think about all these things that way. I am going to be talking about these 10 characteristics and you can listen in and pick out the ones that you feel stand out for whatever group you belong to. Just keep comparing these characteristics to the to the denomination or whatever group you belong to. And then you'll be able to determine whether your antenna should be up, especially if whatever you belong to has like six out of these ten, and especially if it has the damaging ones out of these ten, then 
you you should your antenna should go up very quickly and you should be able to start thinking critically about whatever you belong to so the anatomy of a cult uh these are the specific characteristics and structures that are common among cults and when you when we look at cults in general especially the destructive ones you're going to see the following characteristics number one, there's a charismatic leader so a charismatic leader is usually somebody who is very authoritarian they are um, like an authoritarian figure in that organization or denomination or group that you belong to and they are seen as the source of knowledge and wisdom all knowledge all wisdom and they are unquestioned without them it's like the organization would not even be be in existence for them they want to be worshiped they want to be revered they want to be seen as the all powerful and you're not allowed to question them to question them whenever they do anything whether it's something you believe in or don't believe in it does not matter their word is final they require total obedience their opinion is valued beyond everybody else in the organization like if they have not approved of something then that something will not be done to not be uh, passed along to other people unless they approve so their approval and their validation is what determines what passes and what doesn't um you'll find that w- w- with these charismatic leaders some of them like for example in religious organizations these people will be like um they are prophets of god they have been sent by the, they have been sent to come and preach this particular message so that people can be saved or people can um have their souls rescued from the jaws of the devil i don't know if that's those are the words that they use but i, I know you understand what i mean yeah so um you'll find that the char- charismatic leader believes that they have been sent by god and they have been sent to come and rescue humanity and so for them they have this they, they believe they have this direct connection with god and so it it looks very weird if you're questioning the person who has direct contact with god if they are the prophet of god and you're the person who's coming to question them when they say something then even the group members are going to start looking at you different they're like why are you questioning god's prophet mbona una 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 ongelesha mchungaji hivyo you know they will have this titles in this reverence everybody thinks that they are almighty they should not be questioned they are holy they have they, they are just the ones that have the wisdom and the knowledge and they have access to god and the rest of us are supposed to bow down and worship and be very afraid of of ever making them angry or whatever so you're not supposed to question them and you're supposed to accept everything they say because their word is final um as i mentioned in some cases you're going to find that there's no one specific person who leads the the organization um some some organizations are being led by the ideology and so there's like governing people there are people in the organization who enforce their beliefs and their ideologies of the movement so for example if you look like the church right now if you look at the church you'll find that there's no one if the, the church is probably i believe the church is worshiping god and if the church is worshiping god it's not something tangible god is not something tangible that will walk down the street and you can see yule pale that is the person we worship but then this governing there there are people who govern the church and people who are seen as the people who represent god on earth in one way or another or you'll find that now with the church for example if you're a java witness again this is just an example if you're a java witness there's no one specific person that you people are following but the the java witness as a movement has people that um enforce the beliefs of the 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 church the the religion um and that's the same case with many religions there's no one specific person leading it but then there's a bunch of people who enforce the beliefs of whatever religion you follow or whatever denomination you follow that is something that's going to be very common among um cults in general there's going to be a charismatic leader just because whatever group you belong to has a charismatic leader does not mean that that group is a cult you will find that most of some of the most powerful people on the planet are people who are very charismatic presidents um politicians some of them are uh, public speakers gurus um this self development people most of them are very charismatic because it's the way you present yourself it's the power that you have the way you speak the way you stand in front of people and present your ideas the way you convince people to believe in whatever you believe in it's that charisma that that does not make you a cult leader it's just a characteristic but then what you're saying is most of the cults that exist will have a charismatic leader because they have to follow somebody or something that is the first characteristic um the second characteristic of um a cult is that there is deception and manipulation 
cult leaders will often use deceptive and manipulative te 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 techniques and tactics to recruit people and to control them. So you will never be told the truth, like the truth and nothing but the truth. There will always be something hidden behind the curtain. There's, there's always going to be something that you're not being told. Unambiwa, but unambiwa everything, you know. So they will leave out some things. They will give you half truths. Uh, half tr truths, sorry, I'm struggling with that word. They'll give you half truths. They will make false promises. Um, they will use mind control techniques to make you believe that, to, to make you uh, doubt yourself. They will isolate you from your family and your friends. And you won't even know that they're isolating you in the beginning because it will only make sense that you should not be hanging out with people who are not equally yoked to you. Um, so yeah, you'll find that there's a lot of deception and a lot of manipulation. They never tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. They will always tell you half truths or something will be left out. Something that is vital to you understanding whatever you're getting into will be left out. Um, you'll find that uh, they take uh, b basic and widely accepted and known concepts to build whatever they are trying to sell you on top of. So for example, if they want to, if, if, let's say I give the example of meditation and yoga and all these good things that you want to do for your well-being and mindfulness. So they will take something as basic and as um, well-known and well-accepted as yoga and they will start maybe with a yoga teaching. They will start teaching you about yoga. You'll see an advertisement, oh, we are teaching yoga. Come and start learning yoga at this place, at this place. It will start very simple like that. So it will be, a, for example, a self-development thing. And then with time, they're going now to start infusing very strange beliefs into that practice that practice that you've been doing that thing that they lured you in in with they're going to build weird things on top of it and so that's where they that's where they will be using they will be using the manipulation and the deception and you will never get the entire truth until you've already completely been immersed into the organization um the, the reason the reason they will want to use this widely accepted and known concepts to build on is because it is easy to sell that it is easy to tell somebody uh, come to church, we are praying so that we our nation can heal. Let's say that's an example. That is an easier message to sell than to say, come to church, we are going to start a movement that is going to um, damage every organization that does not agree with us or does not or support the government or does not take care of everybody else or whatever. They will give you a very, they can never tell you that message behind whatever they are selling you in the beginning. So in the beginning, they'll tell you something that is easy to accept because it is widely accepted and known. They will never tell you the entire truth. So that's the thing about deception and manipulation. Most cults uh, will start off by lying to you and they will not outright tell you that they are lying. They'll just leave out information that you would highly, highly need to know before you commit to whatever it is that they want to sell you. They will never tell you that when you join our organization, we are going to isolate you from your family and friends. But they will tell you, you need to be focusing on hanging out with the people in the group because these people in the group are your friends. They are your new family. These people in the groups understand in the group understand what we are trying to achieve as a as a as a group, as a denomination, as a movement. And so it will make sense for you to hang out with these people. It will be easier to sell that idea that these people are your friends, they are your new family, than to tell you stop hanging out with your family entirely. Do not uh, pass whatever information to tell you to those people unless you're convincing them to join us. Do not tell your sisters and your brothers and your family members about this organization unless you're telling them about joining the organization. So they need that deception and that manipulation to keep you um, begging for more, to keep you tethered to them. And that is something that you need to be very, very aware of. You have to be very keen about this. So right now you should be wondering, you should be thinking, whatever organization I belong to, when I joined it, did I join with full knowledge of what I was joining? Or were there some things that were left out that I found out as we continued? And you know, once you've been, once you've been in the group for long, uh, long enough, you're going to find that it's very difficult to step away from whatever you've already been indoctrinated into. Because it's like you've made investments with every single thing that you've attended, every meeting you've attended, every friend you've made in that group, every teaching you've learned, everything that you've done, any time you've spent in that group, any money you've spent with that group, it feels like an investment. And so when, when, when you're presented with new information that is contradicting to whatever you believe in at this point, it feels very difficult to walk away from that. Walking away from that feels like you're walking away from an investment that you've made and nobody wants to lose. Nobody wants to feel like they made a bad investment. And that's why, again, as I'm saying, these people are going to lie to you in the beginning so that you can, they, can, they can sell you things pole pole. 
and with time you're going to find yourself acting and believing things that are very different from what you started out with when you started when you joined the organization or whatever group you're in so assess the group you're in right now and think about when you started when you joined this group did you start with full knowledge of whatever it is they were doing or were there some things you started learning pole pole after you joined and even if you didn't believe in them or you didn't agree with them you could never walk away from that is a very good thing that you should be thinking about right now that's a huge huge characteristic that is very um popular in cults and you want to be careful not to find yourself in a cult so yeah think about it that way um the third characteristic is group thinking cults in general uh, rely on group on group thinking and group conformity cult members are expected to conform to the beliefs and the practices of the group uh without even questioning or critical thinking actually critical thinking is highly 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 discouraged and not tolerated when you're in a cult because critical thinking requires you to ask questions and asking questions means that this charismatic leader that we started talking about in the beginning will be questioned and the whole point of having this charismatic leader who is unquestioned is that you don't raise any concerns you accept whatever you're told and you do whatever you're told you don't ask questions so critical thinking is highly discouraged it is not entertained and when it is noticed some measures will be done to make sure that that critical thinking is um squashed at 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 the bad if that is even a phrase so yeah C- group thinking is a hallmark of cults in general uh the pressure is applied by the leaders but mostly by fellow members so the the leader the leader the charismatic leader will apply a lot of pressure for you to conform to whatever the group believes uh, the group believes and and the fellow members will also pressure you to conform to that so the group members will also be like um why are you causing so much trouble if you start asking questions why are you causing so much trouble why can't you just accept why can't you believe that this god's messenger um why, why would you question god like that uh it, they will even use the uh, for example in church they're going to use the bible verses that tell you that um uh, the chosen of the lord uh, something along the lines of them not being questioned that every leader is chosen by god you know uh th- those are things that group members will keep saying because for them they also are living within the group and they are trying to conform because conformity is easier than raising trouble causing trouble raising questions asking things our uh, critical thinking is highly highly discouraged uh, discouraged you'll notice that when it comes to the group thinking part as well ex members of whatever denomination or group you belong to will be demonized they will be you you will be told that those people are bad do not talk to them do not connect with them if you connect with them we are going to punish you in one way or another they may not use those exact words but you're going to notice that if you if if you connect or you try to talk to ex members of the group you will be seen as a person who is trying to cause trouble and you might be shamed you might be treated differently you might be isolated you might be treated very weird for doing any of those things another way that that um the the organizations and the movements and these cults use this group thinking thing and uh, how they how they enforce it is also by making sure that people do things as groups so you'll find that you will never find uh, these cult members in isolation they are never ever alone ever you will find that they are always hanging out with their fellow cult members they are hanging out with uh, wherever they go there is always somebody else they are going with they never go out alone they never go anywhere without uh, being accompanied you'll find that they share living quarters most of the time you'll find that they share the same spaces on a daily basis there's always somebody around and that somebody is related to the organization it's not somebody who is from outside so they will make sure that you guys do things as a group you will eat together you will be highly encouraged to come to whatever meeting place often you'll find that maybe you have come and eat. it's a church thing you're going to find that you guys have prayer meetings monday to sunday there's always something happening at church every single day of the week so that you can never have enough time to go and spend outside with other people remember this is a technique to isolate you so because you are always always doing something at the church you're either there worshiping preparing for choir to do youth ministry to do this what there's always something you're doing at church you never have enough time to step away and go and hang out with other people who think different who believe wow. different and that is an isolation technique and that is also how they help you become completely conformed to the group because if you are hanging out with people for an extended period of time of course they're going to start becoming your friends that's just how it works you're not going to hang out with people for um 8 hours a day and not like them eventually and even if you don't like them 
that much eventually they're going to start being your friends because these are the same people you're seeing they're the people you go to church with they're the people you talk to they're the people you share your troubles with of course you're going to start conforming to whatever they believe in because that's how it works uh you'll find that some of them go to the extremes of isolating people into places that are away from the rest of the population over there you will be working together sleeping in the same areas um you you will be highly encouraged to hang out together and do not hang out with other people because those other people are doing something that is wrong something that is not acceptable to the organization or movement that you belong to um internal disagreements within the group are highly highly discouraged and the this external scrutiny uh like like the 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 leaders the people who are in control they are always very much involved in whatever you're doing on a daily basis they want to know where you are they, it's like they are monitoring you your movements are constantly monitored your behavior is constantly monitored it's like they are spying on you they always want to know what is happening in your life and anybody from outside is not allowed to come and scrutinize the organization or the movement that that is being a cult at this point so you notice that outsiders are are people that you're not allowed to hang out with and they are not encar- they are not welcome to the group unless they're coming in to become members so cults ordinarily do not want outsiders in unless those people are coming to join and they also make sure that they monitor you 24/7 to know what you're doing so that they can find ways to make sure that you you do not rebel you do not go against whatever they are teaching you and forcing you to do so think about whatever denomination group movement you belong you belong to and and ask yourself is group thinking the norm or are we allowed are we allowed to critically think to ask questions to bring up issues is critical thinking highly encouraged or is it that critical thinking is something that you highly discourage from and it is critical thinking something that is punished that should be something scary for you if whatever you belong to even if it's your family even if it's your friend a group a group friend whatever thing you belong to today even the people you hang out with even the place you work if critical thinking is highly highly discouraged and the people in power are unquestionable you are not allowed to ask them uh, ask questions or to bring up when something uh, to bring up things that are uncomfortable then that should scare you that should be that should be something that raises your antenna again and you need to be asking yourself what exactly am i into because that is something that you should be worried about okay so point number 4 that is the isolation Isolation is the fourth characteristic of cults. Cults are often isolate their members from the outside world and they control their access to information and they limit their contact with non-members. I have mentioned this in the previous point. So cults will make sure that y- y- the things you watch, the things you read, they are the ones who tell you. You are in the in when when, when you're in a cult you are highly encouraged to stick together with a group and you to shun outsiders. So you'll find that there are some things you cannot engage in even if you work with outsiders so for example let's say you are a person who belongs to a particular cult and then wherever you work it's somewhere that there are no other cult members in that organization maybe you work somewhere far where there are no people close to you who who are members of whatever cult you're in so when you're away you will find that you are highly encouraged to not participate in things that those non members non cult members are doing if people are going out uh, let's say to hang out after work you're not you're not allowed to go hang out with them there is something that you need to be doing go pray or go do something go hang out somewhere else go find your fellow kinsmen if i may say so that is uh, an isolation technique that that cults will use they will highly encourage you to go and hang out with the people that are like you and outsiders do not do what outsiders are doing do not tolerate them do not um do not engage in whatever activities they're engaging in do not read the books they are reading if you are if you are if you live in an estate where the, the people around you usually have bonfires and your culture does not allow things like bonfires you'll find that those are the people who will close off their door you will never see them outside mkiwa na estate party they will never show up because for them that's not something that is allowed for, for in, in the in the cult they belong to so think about it that way you'll find that um i've seen i've seen some of them even like in documentaries they will have these places where they will take you outside of wherever you live and have like for example take shakahola for example it was mentioned that with shakahola this guy mackenzie moved the church to some place in the wilderness sukondani kilifu kondani kabisa somewhere far away from the rest of 
the, the, the community. So people were, were completely removed from their kawaida circles. They were removed from their families. People could not see their siblings, their friends, their parents. They were completely isolated from the social circles they have always had. And that is a technique that is used by cults, recruiters and cult runners, people who run cults. They will do that. So they, this is something to cut, cut, you, cut you off from your social circle, from your friends. So because, because your friends and your, and your circle, your social circle, can help scrutinize whatever beliefs you're starting to believe. If you start acting weird, your friends can start calling you out and being like, hey, Shibana, you've changed. What is this thing? You've started going to watch church. What did they tell you? They can help you scrutinize the belief systems you're, you're starting to adopt. But if you're completely cut off from them, it's very difficult for them, for you to, to bounce off ideas on people that care and love for you uh, and love you. So that's that's a technique that most cults will use. They will cut you off from your social circle and they will want you to believe that whatever they're telling you is the only truth. It's the truth and nothing else but the truth and it's the only truth that you should believe in. Um, as I've mentioned, they will demonize outsiders and they will not tolerate or accept outsiders to come into the organization. They will not accept you connecting with outsiders, even ex-members you will not be allowed to. Um, the, 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 cult, the cult group, you'll notice that when it comes to a particular cult group, they will have a set of strange or weird beliefs that are, that are very foreign to the outside world. And so, because, because those beliefs are foreign and they are strange, they are only uh, specific to these particular cults, it's going to make it difficult for you as a cult member to connect to these other outsiders. So it reinforces to you that the beliefs of the cult are the only beliefs that you should be living in, you should be believing in, and that you only truly, truly belong to this particular group that has accepted you fully for who you are because you guys have something in common. So cult member, these cult leaders and cults, the people who run cults do not have these weird beliefs at for for fashion or for show. It is a technique. They're using this to make sure that every time you try to practice that weird belief they have taught you in the cult world. Uh, in the cult group or whatever, every time that you try to practice that weird belief in the outside world where the rest of the world does not understand it, and if the world is very judgmental toward that particular behavior, then it's going to reinforce to you that, hey, by the way, it's true. These outsiders are really bad people. So you see, they don't accept me for the thing that I am doing. I am such a nice person. I am doing this thing that I was taught in my, in my, in my group, and they do not accept it. And so that continu continuously reinforces to you the belief that the only place you belong to, the only place that you truly belong to, the people who actually love and care for you are only the people in this particular cult. And with time, you're going to find yourself now more and more believing in the truths or lies, if I may say, that the cult is feeding you. So think about that as you think about the cults that, that uh, you belong to. Is that, something that they, is that something that you have noticed in whatever group that you belong to, that your beliefs are always reinforcing that that the only place you truly belong to is where the cult tells you that you belong to. The thing about isolation that is also scary is that um, the, the more isolated you become from the outside world, the, the more you also become isolated from yourself because you can no longer trust yourself. Uh, because the isolation from the outer, outside world and the people that you love, your friends, your family, you don't, you, because you're disconnected from them, you're con completely isolated from them, you find that you do not have feedback loops to confirm or, uh, or 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 argue with when it comes to things that you're starting to believe. You can't fully question things. You can't fully question the organization because you don't have anybody to bounce off ideas and doubts with. For you, it's only the things in your head. And if it's not that, then it's the voices that, you're, that are speaking to you from the cult. And so it becomes very difficult for you to actually trust the things that you believe in because everything that you bring up, the, the cult, uh, the cult, the management, whoever is running the cult is always going to have an answer to squash your questions and your doubts every single time. So you never get the opportunity to question anything. And the other thing is that you can never fully question the organization when you're in a cult, especially with the fellow group members, because the group members have already been conditioned to believe that there's always an answer and to, to shut down those doubts that you have. Everybody else believes in whatever the cult leader has said. And so you, when you're doubting, you're alone. And it's very difficult to stand out when you're alone. It's very difficult for you to bring up concerns when you're alone and everybody else seems to believe the same thing. Actually, you can start even doubting yourself. You can be like, Ish, how come I'm the only one who sees this as a problem? Is, am, I, am I the problem? Am I the one with the problem, actually? Because if everybody else 
is, is in the same group as me and they are not doubting. They are not raising trouble. Kwani, what's wrong with me? Why am I the only one who's always causing trouble? So you start doubting yourself. You completely cut off from your own sense of identity. You do not know who you are. You are afraid to bring up your ideas and your doubts and your concerns and your questions because they'll be squashed or you will be treated badly for them. You will either be humiliated, you will be shamed, you will be uh, isolated, you will, some, some things are going to be taken away from you like the love, validation, whatever, it's going to be taken away from you. It's very, very difficult to be the only person standing up arguing things when everybody else seems to be uh, to, to have accepted whatever they have been told. I want you to go and look at something called the ash conformity experiments. And that that ash conformity experiments, you're going to see how it, hel- it it drives this point home. It helps drive this point home about how it's very difficult to stand up and defend something when it's just you. When it's just you, everybody else seems to have accepted whatever truth is being peddled. It becomes very, very difficult for you to just stand up and argue and be the one to be like, hey, apana me, I don't agree with this. It's not many people who can do that. And go go look at the ash conformity experiments. Ash is A S C H conformity experiments. It was done by a psychologist called um, Ash. Was he called Ash? Solomon Ash. Yes, his name is Solomon Ash. So Solomon Ash is a psychologist who was doing experiments about how people conform and why people conform. Just go and look at that thing on the internet, and you will understand what I mean when I talk about um, isolation and how, when you doubt yourself, when everybody else seems to have accepted, it's very difficult for you. To just stand up and be like me, Stakubali, I am walking away from this thing. It's very, very difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. Think about the group you belong to. Has it isolated you? Has it put you in a place where you are not allowed to connect with other people from outside? And has it made you start demonizing outsiders? Has it made you start thinking that every time somebody s- speaks about something that you do not agree with, something that is that is that um does not go hand in hand with whatever you've been fed, when somebody brings up a, a different point of view from whatever you've been fed in whatever group you belong to. Think about how you react to that and what makes you think that this person is a bad person or is uh, is, is is the enemy because they have brought out um, a contradicting point of view. Think about that very, very deeply and compare it to whatever group you belong to. How many times have you had people bring up a contradicting points of view, one that does not go hand in hand with whatever you believe in and then your first your first thought was this person is bad this person is my enemy this person anitaki instead of hmm interesting point i've never thought it of it that way tell me more that's how that's how you're supposed to be approaching contradicting points of view contradicting points of view are not meant to be fought all the time contradicting points of view are meant to help you learn more about the thing that you believe in actually they're meant to help you test whether whatever you believe in is solid or not solid because those contradicting points of view will 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 poke holes into into whatever argument you have they will help you see things you've never seen so if your first if your first um reaction when somebody brings in a different point of view from whatever you believe in if they tell you that they don't know if god exists and your first reaction is you're a heathen you're going to hell instead of hmm interesting able tell me more what why do you think god does not exist what do you th- where is that coming from what what literature are you reading from what where are, where is this coming from you know if that's not your first reaction if your first reaction when somebody says god does not exist or something against christianity and you're a christian and the first reaction you have is hey you you're a heathen you're going to hell spend your time away we are unequally yoked get lost stay away from me get thee behind me satan watch yourself watch yourself watch yourself <laughs> Yeah, so basically, yeah, think about these things that way. Um, allow me to go to the next point, which is uh, the, fi- the fifth characteristic of cults. Rituals and practices. So you'll notice that most cults will have very unique rituals and practices that are intended to create a sense of belonging and identity among its members. For example, look at the Catholic Church. We, uh, I'm speaking as a Catholic, somebody who has been brought up in the Catholic Church. We have our rituals and our, and, our, and our practices that we do that make us feel that we belong. If I leave Nairobi and I go to Rome and I go to uh, whichever country in the world, I go to the US, I go to the UK, there are some things I know when I step into a Catholic church, those things are going to happen. Liwe diwalo. And so there's an, there's an identity that I, I, I have when it comes to Catholic, being a Catholic <laughs> that I can already relate to. If I meet a fellow Catholic, I know how to relate to them because of the things that we have done in the Catholic Church that are our rituals and our practices. So you'll find that most uh, most, most 
cults will have their unique rituals and their pract uh, their practices and those rituals and practices make you feel that you belong somewhere and you know that these people are your people so for example if i'm walking down the street and i see a person with a cross on their face a black cross drawn on their face i know it's ash wednesday most probably and i understand that automatically by seeing them and i know they are catholic and i know if i was to start a conversation what what we would probably talk about um again this is not the only thing we we'll talk about i'm just saying that that is something that i can identify easily i can pick them from a crowd and be like hmm you're catholic i can see you have uh, the mark of the cross on your across your face uh, in black it's not in red or purple or pink i can see it's black so i'm assuming it's ash wednesday and you got this because you're catholic yeah and so cults ordinarily will have um will have these markers, uh, uh, practices that they do so that everybody feels that they belong Again, I have said that just because these things exist in whatever group you belong to does not mean that automatically that group is a cult. Remember, almost everything we belong to, we belong to it because there's an, a sense of belonging that we get from them. We, there's an identity we share with, the, with whatever group members we are in, in whatever we belong to. So if you are a person who is Kenyan, there's something that as Kenyans we do that gives us the Kenyan identity. If you are somebody from another country, there's something that is uniquely... Uh, uniquely unique to your country people to your kinsmen that you can easily identify them and you feel that you belong with them because of these specific things that you guys do yeah and so as i've said just because whatever you belong to has a ritual or a practice does not mean that it is a cult take take this as be open minded about these things um you'll notice that some 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 cults will have uh these rituals and practices will include things like changing of names some people will be told they have to change their names they will be told they have to change the way they speak they will be told they have to change the lifestyles they live the dressing once the dressing one is very very common prophet prophet what a prophet or you can see them from a mile away utawaona tu and you will know it's them why because there's a way that they dress all of them just wear the same outfit different color but same design right and so i'm not saying prophet over by the is a cult i'm just pointing out that they have a dress code and so you find that in their in their in their church that is a thing and you can't fault them that's that's how they are even if you want to so if you join that church you can't go there and start saying hey apana me sijazoya na vanga jeans guys will be like uh, okay but this is not the place this is not the place in the, here we wear the long dress and the head scarf we tie our we 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 cover our he, our heads So think think uh, along those lines when you think about the rituals and practices you'll find that these um, rituals and beliefs and practices have very strong meaning attached to them they're not just things that people can discard at will you know and and the thought of breaking these rituals these beliefs these practices it usually seems like a life or death situation for the people who belong to that particular movement or organization for them you can tell a prophet or war person to show up in tights and boots and a crop top that would never be a thing why because for them there's a very strong meaning that has been attached to the dressing that they they have as as a as a church there's a very strong identity attached to that there's a very strong meaning attached to dressing like that and it must have been hammered into them because there's no other way you can convince me that the numbers they are there are so many of them they just took up one morning and said okay fine let's just wear the same clothes it's easier because now we'll be able to identify each other on the street that's not probably the reason there must be a reason why they 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 started dressing like that there there must be a reason that has been shared with them over and over again for a very long time and that has been passed from one generation to the next to make sure that everybody understands why they need to dress the way they do and that's the same case for every other like denomination maybe that dresses up in a particular way think of the akorinos uh think of the way they dress they, they have specific outfits that they wear they have places that they congregate you're not going to just be walking down the street and stumble upon a mokorino you know uh you're not just going to be walking down uh, in town you enter a club and you find a mokorino that's not how they operate and so it's very difficult for them to shed these things because for them this is their way of life this is what they have known and and that dressing the behavior the rituals the practices have a very very strong meaning that meaning cannot just be shared by taking off the outfit you know and it's not something that they can just wake up one morning and be like i will no longer wear this that's not how it, or that, that's not how it works because again some of these things are very psychological um you'll find that uh, breaking breaking some of the rules and the uh, uh, or these rituals if you do something ag- that goes against the rituals that you guys ordinarily do you know whatever uh, group you belong to um you're going to find that that 
that comes with a lot of public shaming. Uh, uh, you will be treated differently if you show up at a prophet of war event. If you're a member, when you one of the church ladies or church gentlemen, no mekuja leo kama umeva the wrong outfit. By wrong, I mean the one does not that does not conform to the prophet of war uh, dress code. Yeah, you're going to find that that might come with a lot of public shaming, a lot of a lot of um, isolation. You might be told to go back home. In, uh, they may even stand. I, I have never been to a prophet of war thing. This is pure speculation. But I am saying that, for example, if you show up dressed in your tights and your boots and your crop top, you might find that maybe the prophet will be like, a uh, prophet of war will be like, uh, Ebu, Ebu, come, come here. Could you smile me altar? Can I see what you're wearing? Why are you dressed like this? You know, that is not how we do it. And you might find that maybe Uta Teteshwa and then when we go back home and then maybe the rest of the sermon will be about you. People have changed. Kwa Kanisa, you're not doing the things you have agreed upon. Again, I am saying this is an example and it is pure speculation. Actually, if you're a prophet of world follower and um, you're listening to this, please get in touch with me and tell me if this is something that could or could not happen or how, like, what what would be the reaction if somebody showed up in their crop top and their tights uh yeah so basically public shaming that that can be very um difficult for most people to deal with being uh, being brought into ukumbele uh, kwa kwa altari so that you can come and and, and be uh, embarrassed for whatever you have done uh, showing up in the wrong outfit or showing up doing doing the wrong thing not going to mass at the right time if it's a mass thing depending on whatever ritual it is that you and your people follow you're going to find that if you break that ritual, if you break that practice, there's going to be shame about, around it. You're going to be embarrassed by the, um, sorry, you're going to be embarrassed by the organization for um, breaking that ritual. And that's why people will continue doing the things, conforming to that behavior over and over again. Because that 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 public shaming is just too much to deal with. Nobody wants to be the, the subject of ridicule and humiliation in public. So if, if there's fear that you're going to be treated differently, you're going to be isolated, you're going to be publicly shamed, if there's that fear in you, you're going to find that compliance and obedience is the main desire for almost every single person. Nobody wants to break the rules. Nobody wants to break the rituals. Everybody wants to do what is supposed to be done so that they never become the subject of whatever uh, punishment they would get for breaking the rules. Um you, you will find that they will ask you very weird questions. You might find that you're the person being asked if you are trying to uh, endanger the kingdom of God. If, for example, whatever you belong to is a Christian denomination and they believe that they have been sent by God, the, the, the person, this leader has been sent by God. They'll ask you if you want to endanger the kingdom of God by your behavior. You didn't join the two-week fasting that we had said we were going to do. You're going to be the, the person who makes this mission, God's mission, not succeed. So why are you not doing what you're supposed to do? Do you want to lead everybody else to internal damnation? You want them to go to hell with you? The devil the devil has entered you, you know. They will ask you if you're questioning the, the chosen one of the Lord. Are you, you're making people sin with you. These are all tactics that are geared towards compliance, obedience, making sure that you follow the rules that have been set out by the person who is leading whatever movement you're in. If you belong to a group, denomination, movement, whatever, and there are rituals and, and uh, practices that are expected of you, and if you don't comply with them, you are treated differently, you're isolated, you're punished physically, emotionally, psychologically. If there's something, some form of punishment that comes, up, uh, comes with you not doing what uh, the organization believes you should be doing, then question your organization. Question yourself. And you'll say, am I in a cult or not? I want to move on to the next point. I think I have belabored this particular point. So allow me to move on to the next point. Another characteristic of cults is that there is a lot of exploitation. Financial, sexual, physical, um, cult members will be pressured to donate money to the to the what to the particular cult. Or they will require you to do to, to volunteer your work your, your hours and your skill set to whatever course they are doing. For, for for no pay, sometimes, most of the time, they will want you to work for free. If you are a social media person, they want you to come and do social media for the organization for free. And it is passed on as, uh, it is it is touted as volunteer. You're volunteering for, if it's a church, for the Lord. You're doing the Lord's work. Um, there'll be a lot of exploitation in, in, in those aspects. So you'll find that you, if, if, for example, they have isolated you to a place that is far away from 
the general population will be required to work you'll be required to lima shamba mpate chakula you're the one in the fields you're constantly working everybody there is always working you're always tired because you're always working constantly 24/7 you work long hours there's no pay uh, you're, you're told to um sell your belongings and bring the money to church so that you can uh, you can you can support the lord's work you are so you see if 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 um for example you sell all your belongings and bring all your the proceeds to church it means you're left without financial security if you have no financial security anybody can take advantage of you they can decide that they're not they are going to give you only the the basic needs are going to get covered they are going to offer you food and shelter end of story and there's nothing you're going to do because you have nothing else you have nowhere to go and maybe you ukombadi you have no access to your friends and your family who can support you so think about it that way they will exploit you a lot and and the thing about keeping you constantly working keeping you constantly tired always working always doing something is that you you, you there's no room left you don't have time to think and question and talk to other people outside or to talk to other mem- group members you can't even form a coup you know cuz you're tired ukitoka uko nje to do the mission the lord's work maybe remember you're supposed to spend the next um entire week winning souls for the lord and bringing people to church so you spend your entire day tamaking nairobi looking for followers people who can come to church with you on sunday you're going to door to door knocking and preaching the gospel of the lord at what time by the time first of all if you get home which is maybe june you you're getting home maybe at around 10 pm you're tired you just want to eat and you want to sleep and tomorrow morning you know you're waking up to go and start again looking for people to win to the lord of course you're going to be tired you don't have time to now think about other things in your life you don't have time to sit down and do research on the internet you don't have time to sit down and listen to a podcast that could help you uh, get out of a cult you don't have the time to sit down and talk to uh, your neighbor you don't have time to talk to your family members you're not allowed to talk to your family members so there's that exploitation aspect and keeping you working keeping you exhausted keeping you occupied 24/7 and monitoring your every move monitoring the people you speak to monitoring the time you spend wherever you you spend it that is just a technique to make sure that they know your move they know how to find you and they know how to squash any uprising that might occur as a result of too much free time on your hands yeah so that is something that happens a lot in cults um the seventh characteristic of a cult is that there is abuse and control you will find that uh cults will use physical and emotional abuse to control members and they, they will create this uh, culture of fear and intimidation to maintain obedience and the reason i want to I, i wanted to separate exploitation and and abuse and control is because with exploitation it you'll find that it's about you giving things to the organization you giving uh, your time you being used physically uh, being used sexually for the gratification of whoever the leader is but when it comes to this abuse and control part it is the part where they actually get into your mind completely and they make sure that you live in fear remember i started this by saying that cults operate on fear without fear the cult might fall apart so they need to be inside your mind to intimidate you constantly to make you to make sure that you are afraid to make sure that you 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 are afraid of being publicly shamed of being humiliated you don't have uh, freedom of association you don't have freedom of speech you will see like for example in this um this churches this tele televangelist churches that tunonanga kwa tv you will see that when somebody wants a miracle they will be told to come to the front and sometimes they will be asked very um intrusive questions very personal questions they'll be asked questions about uh, their personal lives things that you would never tell somebody in public not even in public especially in public when there's a camera that is right in front of your face you know and there's an entire church that is just listening there are so many people some people are shouting cheering you on you're afraid and and then the, the leader is just speaking at you like after they don't give you a minute to think they're just asking you question after question they they are constantly in your ear you know they want you to say something you say something it's like if you say something wrong they are going to punish you or something you know and you'll find that is just a technique they use to make sure that you do not have time to think they want you to just feel very anxious and then you will just start spewing things and you'll find yourself just speaking 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 with no moment to breathe no moment to think about what you've just said and that is a technique to keep you obedient to keep you afraid to keep you intimidated to make sure that you cannot think for yourself think about it that way um there's a there's a there's another characteristic characteristic number eight, which is dependence you'll find that uh most cults we 
remember we mentioned about the thing about about um uh, about uh, isolation the thing with isolation and its connection to dependence is that they will keep you connected to them 24 7 connected to the organization so for example if you have to give something up for example they'll they be like you have to give up your your let's say your finances and use everything you have and bring the proceeds to the church or to the re, uh, group so that we can all support each other here in the group you, 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 your money is not just your own your money is now uh, now becomes to the uh, uh, part of the group uh, finances so it means that you do not have financial independence if you do not have financial independence you can just get get up and leave so they have completely made sure that you're connected to them financially. You're connected to the cult financially. You cannot just get up and leave. If, for example, they say that you cannot uh, connect with your family and your friends, if they tell you that one of the rules is that you have to step away from your family and your friends because they are, they are, they are derailing you, they are talking you out of uh, doing the thing that you've been called for, they'll find a reason to make sure that you know that you need to stop engaging with your family and your friends. So they cut you off from your relationships. Then now it means the only people you have to con uh, in contact, uh, the only people you're in contact with often are the people in the cult. Nobody else, nobody from outside. And so you're dependent on them for friendship uh, and, and, and for human connection. That is the social circle that you have. There's nobody else because they have made you cut off the ties with out the outside world. So you're dependent completely on them. Ah, yeah. If they say, for example, that you have to... Um, you have, you have to to give up your personal goals and pursue the goals of the organization because now akuna there's no there's no we in cult there, there's no i in cult it's just we you become a group your personal identity is completely erased so if you do not have a personal identity you do not have personal goals that you're pursuing it means you're pursuing the goals of the organization you're pursuing the goals of the group so it means you're completely connected to the group and you're dependent on them because now you need to work as a team because you're working towards the same goal Akuna story, me personally, there's this thing I want to pursue, there's this thing I want to chase. It is always about the, the group. It's always about the cult at all times. And so, if they cut you off from all these things, all these things that you could potentially have outside of the cult, the cult becomes your sole source of financial freedom and your sole, sole, sole source of finances and emotional connection and emotional support. They're the only people who understand you because they have made you have these rituals and beliefs and practices that are not... Um, acceptable to the outside world. They become the only people that you cannot connect with. That becomes a problem because you do not have access to other people and you're completely dependent on the organization. And they will make you see that if you leave the organization, you will never survive on your own outside of the organization. Because where are you going to? Your friends uh, have discarded you. Your family members have abandoned you. You do not have a job. You do not have money. You do not have anything. Where are you going to if you leave the organization? And they will keep reminding you that you, you only have the organization to depend on. There's nobody else out there who loves you and cares for you. They will show you, they will try to show you how they are the only people who have the best interest, your best interests at heart. They will try to show you that they, they are the only people who understand you, the only people who want to support you. And they will keep reinforcing the things that they have done in the past to make you see that constantly, they are the only people you have. And so you'll find you will never want to be um, set apart from the, your, your, your cult members, fellow cult members. Mutaka kuwa now 24-7 because they, they are your only friends. They're the only people that you know. Um, the, the point number nine, which is the, the other characteristic of a cult, is that for them, the end justifies the means. You will find that most cults will have a lot of criminal behavior going on and that criminal behavior will be rationalized because it is all for, let's say it's a religious cult, it's all for God's glory. Uh, we are all doing this for, so that we can get to heaven, you know. Um, you'll remember that cult I mentioned, like the, the one by Credonia, the one I mentioned um, in, the, in the previous episode. That cult, people were, were burned to death as a shortcut to heaven, you know. And, and ordinarily, that, that is, that is, uh, that, that's a huge crime. But but you'll find that the person committing the crime in at the back of their mind, I work like I'm committing a crime. For them, they have a justification, and the justification, uh, for them, uh, they, they believe in it completely. I understand what you mean that they have done something wrong, because for them, the end justifies the means. Will we get to heaven? Yes, it does not matter how we get there. So for them, Lazima will do whatever it takes to do to to achieve the mission you have come with. Think about um, Shakahola. 
Mackenzie's mission was what? Uh, he said that people were going to meet Jesus. So the, 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 the end was supposed to be what? Meeting Jesus. What were the means? People starving to death. Of course, that is horrible, 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 a horrible way to die. That was horrible, especially considering there were children there, children who did not choose to go through that kind of pain. But for them, the end justifies the means. And they will make they will make sure that they convince you that the end justifies the means. They will never let you think that there's anything wrong with whatever they are doing. Because for them, they are serving a greater purpose and that greater purpose will be will be met no matter what the price is. This, they don't care what price has to be paid. What lives get lost, who gets hurt, they don't care at all. Follow, uh, read up on all the cults that I've mentioned in the past and even other cults. Just read on them and you'll see how many human uh, human human rights crimes were committed during the reign of those cults. You're going to see how people did things that, that hurt people on so many levels and they got away with them, some of them, of course. Others were arrested and yes, that was justice. So yeah, those are those are things that happened. And justifies the means for them. Um, yeah, that's a thing. The last but definitely not least characteristic of a cult is that there's always a catastrophe, an imminent doom. Something is coming up, something big. We are going to heaven or the world is ending or Jesus is coming back. Um, uh, people are going to hell because of their sins. There's always something big that is going to happen. The world is going to end on date, flani of flani. For them, it will be act now, act now. If you don't act now, something bad is going to happen. You need to do it right now. Akuna time ya kuenda ati consult with your friends and your family members. That is a characteristic of cults. They do not allow you to have time to think about anything because they believe they have the answer and you need to do whatever they're telling you right now, right now. So think about think about these 10 points that I have mentioned. Think about these points deeply, deeply, deeply and ask yourself whatever you belong to, is it a cult or not? And I would I would be very uh, keen to see, especially the damaging ones are the ones that I look out for to determine whether whatever you belong to is a cult or not. First of all, whatever cult you belong to, is there deception and manipulation? That is a big one. Because as I said, a charismatic leader is not an indicator. It's not always an indicator that whatever you belong to is a cult. So, number one, deception and manipulation. Whatever you belong to. Did you join it knowingly? Did you know everything that you needed to know before you joined? Ama, it's a thing that you kept getting introduced to. Things that you do not agree with. Things you do not believe in. And you just continuously accepted them as you went along. Because you had already been in the organization. And it felt like you were coerced or whatever. Was there deception and manipulation in the thing that you belong to right now? Is there deception and manipulation? Number two, uh, another damaging one is the isolation. In whatever you belong to right now, is there isolation? Do they insist that you only have to hang out with people that are in the cult, that you're not supposed to communicate with outsiders, you're not supposed to communicate with ex-members or whatever you, you belong to? Is that something that happens in whatever group you belong to? Number three, something else that is uh, that, that should make you want to know what, whether whether whatever you're in is a cult. Group thinking. Is critical thinking highly, highly discouraged in whatever you belong to? If every time you raise a question, you're treated differently, you're publicly shamed or even uh, not necessarily publicly, but you're told, Bana, you're raising too many problems. Why can't you never just accept things? Why are you always uh, making too much of a fuss? Is critical thinking a problem? that that is is discouraged from whatever you belong to if that is a thing then you need to question whatever you belong to because we can't all be conformers you can't conform to everything you need to be able to think critically especially in our current world there are so many things that people are doing that need to be questioned and so if whatever you belong to you're not allowed to question things the leader is the perfect person that should never be questioned Whatever you, the, the, if it's a, it's a, if for example it's Christians, the Bible, you're not allowed to question the Bible, because why are you questioning the Word of God? Ask yourself questions. Those are things you need to be thinking about. Um, something else that you need to highly, highly think about to know whether whatever you belong to is a cult is the exploitation factor. Have you been forced to financially or sexually or physically submit to the organization in one way or another? Are you being treated like an object? Are you are you being are you being told that you have to give up your earthly belongings completely and live uh, like a mtuana mwelekeo? Because at now, whatever you're doing, everything you're doing is for the Lord. You have to think about that. Are you being exploited? Are you being exploited? Are you being told that you need to work 
without pay are you being forced to volunteer your time your resources are you being told that you need to give up if you have a piece of land but yani hiyo shamba tujenge kanisa ama tujenge something you know are you being made to give up your belongings at because you are supposed to give them up to the the group or the denomination something else you think you need to think about is there abuse and emotional control this thing for intimidating you and making you constantly live in fear at oh uh, if if you don't uh, submit you you are a bad person is that something that happens in whatever you belong to that is something you need to be asking yourself if there's no freedom of speech there's no freedom of association that is something that should scare you some something else that should scare you is the dependence part has the group that you belong to made it made sure made it their mission to convince you in whatever way they can that you will never be anything beyond what you are with them that they are the your they are your only source of support they are the only people who care are about you you will never survive on your own if you live is that something that is highly highly uh, spoken about all the time in the group unaambia ngo ukitoka hapa wewe juu utafilisika your life will end if you leave us we are the only people who care about you uko nje there is nothing for you is that something that you've been told or something that you've seen happening in whatever you belong to um the last one that could be a, a huge indicator that that whatever you belong to is a cult and that you should be scared of is the thing about um the end justifying the means and criminal behavior being rationalized people doing things that you know are criminally wrong mtu anafanya kitu you're like hey but see that is that is just wrong even like as a human being you just you're just like ah yeah pana that is not something that should be happening but it is happening and you're not allowed to question it and and if when you question it you're being told that you are questioning god's will ama god's purpose ama whatever the purpose of the group you belong to whatever purpose they are serving you're being told that you're questioning it is that something that happens so think about those points think about those points especially as i've said the more the more of these points out of these 10 the more points you have that are going on in your whatever group you belong to the more you should be concerned if maybe your group has one or two of these points maybe it might not even be a cult i don't know but you need to think hard about what exactly is happening if for example your group whatever group you belong to has um this thing for rationalizing criminal behavior and there's imminent doom then you should be scared because why are people rationalizing criminal behavior that is scary and then some of these things are so dependent on each other like for example most of these behaviors most of these um characteristics cannot happen without a charismatic leader for example hapa kwa group thinking and deceiving and manipulating you need somebody who can, uh, can can convince people with soft words and sometimes even harsh words and who knows human psychology to be able to manipulate people to believe that they should band together all all along never never question always stay together stick together because we are the only ones who care about you all those things fall under the characteristics of a of a cult and so again i will tell i will i will remind you of the big question which is are you in a cult are you in a cult with that said i hope you have found this very educational and informative this has been my favorite topic in doing the research about cults because it just opens your eyes completely to a new world that you didn't even know belong uh, existed so think about the things that you believe in think about the the groups you belong to think about the groups that your family and your friends belong to and ask yourself if they are cults then let's meet next episode and talk about the psychology of cults what do cult leaders what psychological tricks do cult leaders use to convince you to join their cult or to stay in the cult how do they manipulate you psychologically so that you can continue staying in the cult you can continue defending the cult that is what we'll be covering in the next in the next ep- episode of the cult series as i said there's a lot more in store that's not the only thing we'll be talking about i said we're going to talk about why people join cults how people join cults how how are you lured what makes you an easy target of of um getting into a cult uh what is the process of indoctrination we are going to be talking about all that we are going to be talking about the motivations behind cult leaders why do they do the things they do those are things we are going to be talking about and how social media makes um makes it easy to get indoctrinated into a cult as uh, among other things we're going to be covering a lot a lot in this series so yes with that said thank you so much for coming through for listening to this episode i hope you have learned something and i hope that you're going to share this episode with somebody who might 
need it share this information to sikai kwa giza let's let's not sit in the dark and let's not allow our friends and our families to stay in the dark bring up this conversation with your family and your friends hear their perspectives about whether they whether they believe they in a cult or not and and uh let's 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 educate each other wacha tu elimishane tupelekane mbele so that uh, we figure uh, we figure out this thing vizuri thank you so much for listening to this episode thank you so much for sticking with me i will see you in the next episode have a good one take care of your mental health take care of yourself and kwaheri <laughs>